Well, okay, this is the hidden anomalies of Antarctica, including the latest updates. I went to Antarctica a little over two years ago in the beginning of 2019 on a 72 foot sailboat with 11 Poles and three Americans, including myself. And this was the first stop at the Arktowski Research Station run by the Polish government. And I'm gonna get into research stations and a lot of the real science that is going on there. But first a little backstory about how we got down there. It was uh, my partner at the time, Emily Infinity. We were driving down across South America with the goal of getting on a boat to Antarctica. The first option was to get on a cruise ship, but cruise ships only go for uh, two days over the Drake Passage, five full days in Antarctica, and then two back. So the one advantage is less time on the stormiest seas of the world, which are the Southern Ocean. And here's one for you, Jim, if you're still listening. If you want to win a bar bet, name the five oceans of the world. We all know Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, Arctic, but the fifth is the Southern Ocean. And this particular area between South America and Antarctica, the Palmer Peninsula, are the stormiest seas of the world. So it's quite a challenge to get there um, across the Drake Passage. And you can see on uh, the map on the right, just a little bottom portion of South America. And then that water passage is the Drake. And because it separates the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, it is notoriously stormy seas and very high swells. By the time we got out on the uh, Drake after crossing the Beagle Channel, which was named after Darwin and his voyage around the world on the Beagle when he developed his theory of evolution, that was nice and calm. And I remember uh, putting my arm around Emily saying, hey, this ain't too bad. Look, here we go. Dolphins are swimming by us and penguins and it was nice calm seas well as soon as we turned on the drake oh boy let the rock and roll show begin and we both became violently ill with seasickness as did most of the people on the boat but not our captain who fearlessly steered the chief one sailboat to the arktowski base 92 hours later so that's a little of the backstory getting there um Getting on the sailboat is another story for another time. We'll just dive right in. And this is a former whaling station on King George Island. And that's located just on the upper left here. One of the larger of the Pan-Antarctic Islands. And we'll be talking about a few of these islands throughout this presentation because there are some hidden anomalies out there that we're gonna delve right into. Well, I start out with this slide in my presentation to show the two sides of Antarctica. You have one, these are very recent maps, the first being a reference elevation model of Antarctica, showing smack dab in the middle, you have the South Pole. And that's up on the polar plateau, that whole area to the right, I'll be referring to this often, is over two miles thick in ice. So the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, right there in the middle, is over two miles high. So it's at about 11,000 feet, and it's a very, very dry continent, the driest continent on Earth. Very little precipitation makes it up there, which makes this two mile thick sheet of ice even more intriguing because it's very, very ancient. But as we'll see, Antarctica had once been a tropical climate, replete with dinosaur species, ferns, and megafauna, as well as megaflora. So on the right here is another recent map. Just before my journey, I was collecting maps and pouring over them, trying to find a lot of information. And this particular map came out from NASA, showing areas of the continent that are warming up in red, including the stretch of islands and continent on the northern tip of the Palmer Peninsula, where I was visiting, all up in here. 
uh, or on this map more precisely, this region, including these islands, all in red, all heating up, all undisputedly having melting events of the large glaciers, as well as more frequent calving of the large ice shelves. Whereas in the blue, this is quite paradoxical, there are areas that are cooling down and there are areas that are accumulating ice. And I suppose that's why we don't see the sea level rises drastically around the world. Because remember the saying, water seeks its own level. So if there was a sea level rise somewhere, it would eventually even out everywhere else. Because essentially we live on a water planet. A lot of people forget this little fact that land is only 21% of all the land masses in the world and oceans by far three quarters of the planet cover the surface. So we really live on an ocean planet and there are these seven continents that stick out <laughs> that were once all connected. And I'll show you some pictures of Pangea here in a little bit. So uh, <clears throat> we have rising and falling of the ice shelves. That happens every year. It basically extends well out to uh, the outer periphery right now. Most everybody is leaving Antarctica if they haven't left already because of uh, the, the changing of the seasons are coming on now and we've just passed the equinox. So uh, winter is coming soon and it is fierce when it gets there. So this is a claim of Argentina. The, and now you can clearly see that Drake Passage um, right about here is Ushuaia. That's about where 90% of all the boat traffic leaves. And then in Chile side in Punta Arenas, right about here is where about 90% of the flight traffic occurs. And the, the, that flight traffic also includes a stopover if you're going inland around Union Glacier here. And then they can make uh, trips all the way to Pole or elsewhere. So flights come in and cruise ships uh, mostly in these straits here. Now, according to the Antarctica Treaty, no country can make or maintain their claims. Now, they'll have bases there and they'll do different uh, operations that they've normally done. But really, this land does not belong to Argentina or anyone else. Because per the Antarctica Treaty, um, it was allotted to the whole world. It's basically a biosphere park. So in 1961, this was ratified. And it is one of the longest standing treaties that has held among all world bodies to date. And if you wanted to, and you had the uh, income to support a base for your country, there are many countries that do, over 50 countries that do, as you can see here on this map, including uh, <clears throat> three large ones of the United States, and that being uh, the Palmer Base, which I visited on the Palmer Peninsula, Amundsen Scott Cell Pole Station, and the largest base in Antarctica, McMurdo, or its nickname MacTown, and that's accessed by New Zealand below. And then we're going to look at this region up here, which uh, on most maps called Queen Maud Land, uh, but we'll refer to it as New Schwabenland. And here you can see a uh, West German bases never left um, and that Germany still operates at those bases to this day and we'll get into that in a little bit. Antarctica is a beautiful country. These are just some shots I took. It won't be so much of my experience down there but more what I found. As far as I know I'm the first researcher who's gone down there with the express purpose of trying to get to the bottom of a lot of these subjects such as whether there is uh, anti-Diluvian civilizations under the ice, craft under the ice, um, or pyramids sticking through. And we'll get to that in the second half of this talk in the speculation section. But what you'd find if you went down there is a vast wilderness. Uh, right now, as everybody has left the continent, there are only 1,000 people in the entire continent of Antarctica, which is the fifth largest continent in the world, about the size of two Australias or uh, the lower 48 uh, in size. So it's about 3,000 miles across, 
uh, in both directions and just stunningly beautiful, especially the Palmer Peninsula, which in geological terms is much younger. And it's really like two continents that are slamming together. And so the mountain features here are really spectacular. Some of these mountain peaks are only being climbed in the recent years. The one on the bottom here, I know I remember reading in The Lonely Planet because it just reminds me of Yosemite, just straight down pitches with these glaciers falling off the sides. That this particular peak uh, on the bottom here was only climbed in 1991. So a lot of these mountains, um, and there's so many you see on the trip, are still being named and still being climbed. So a lot of room for adventure. And here's a typical one of the cruise ships we saw. They're not as big as the mage cruise ships you see. They have to be uh, specifically retrofitted for cruising in the ice regions. So they're smaller and more expedition style cruises that go down there. And on the right here is uh, Port Lockerbie, which is an old British military station that was started to spy on the Nazis in New Schwabenland. And today it's a museum and the southernmost post office in the world that you can mail home postcards from. Some really interesting things about Antarctica. It has four poles. There is the geographic South Pole, which we all know as the bottom of the earth. You can walk around the geographic South Pole in a few minutes and walk through every single 24 time zone. You have the magnetic pole, which is quickly racing off the continent. It's down here, it's already off the continent. And the magnetic south pole is where all compasses point to in the south, but it's not, of course, the geographic south pole. So you get a false reading. It took mariners a long time to figure that one out. Similarly, the North Pole is now racing across the Arctic Ocean on its way over towards Siberia. So both of the magnetic poles are moving quicker than recorded history has known them to move. And that's somewhat interesting in and of itself. And I'll get into a little bit about the possibility of a pole shift scenario that um, could be suggestive of these magnetic poles moving so quickly. You also have the geomagnetic pole, and this is where most of the uh, southern lights can be seen from at the Vostok station. And then finally, the pole of maximum inaccessibility. That is the point on a landmass that is the farthest away from any civilization in the world. So I point this out just to say, if there was ever a place to hide out on land or at sea, it would be these parts of the polar plateau in Antarctica or the deepest recesses of the ocean are the last truly unmapped and unknown areas on the surface of Earth. So here's my boat, Chief One, the front of it, as we're entering into Deception Island and Deception Bay, and this is an area called the uh, Neptune's Bellows, this very narrow strait we're about to enter, and it has taken down many a shipwrecks. That's not who's buried here on the right. That was an old whaling village we went into that has been uh, covered over by recent eruptions of Deception Volcano. It's very much an active volcano, as is the whole continent of Antarctica, with 91 known active volcanoes throughout the continent, this being one of them. And several of the research stations also were destroyed in the most recent eruption in 1969 and had to evacuate and relocate. So this is a land of instability and a lot of uh, earth power down here, including what's coming in from the sky, and that is meteorites by the hundreds every year. And this is the best place on the planet to look for meteorites because they just stand out on the snow and they'll eventually get taken down by the movement of the polar plateau. Glaciers are much like fluid bodies of water, but in slow motion. 
the ice caps are always moving. The, once they get down to uh, the water level, then the ice shelves eventually break up and calving is the word and float to uh, warmer waters and eventually melt. But Antarctica is in, always in a constant state of flux with the volcanism and then you have the meteorites uh, which then get deposited along the spine here, as you can see, mostly along the Antarctic mountain range. And there's a ridge of mountains that go all the way up from the Palmer Peninsula, kind of like a big sinuous S through the entire continent. And here are the tallest mountains in Antarctica, including right around here, Vincent Massif, which is the tallest mountain in Antarctica. Uh, at over 14,000 feet tall. So a lot of people who go around the world to climb all seven continents, tallest mountains, well, they'll have to make a trip down here in Vincent Massif. And a lot of people do it every year. But last year, no travel in Antarctica. And it's possible that it'll be hard to travel through Argentina or Chile, South Africa or New Zealand in the coming years, unless all the restrictions on travel are lifted. So here they find the meteorites and this is what they look like when they find them. There's a whole team every year in the Antarctic summer that goes down there. The Antarctic Search for Meteorites is an investigation team that searches for these rare rocks every summer. And this is what it would look like on the left if you were to find one, uh, often wind blown, but uh, moving around on top of the polar plateau. And then when they find it, they treat it much like a contaminated object and wearing uh, only making contact with it uh, as they would with hazmat suits. Uh, they take them out for collection, send them out to Houston where they will examine them uh, in NASA. And then if people want to request them at educational institutions, they can and NASA will send them out. So we all remember what this was. Well, it was the very first confirmed life from an out of earth planetary system. Not too far away. This is what it looked like from Mars. This microscopic uh, bacteria, I believe it was, that was discovered on a meteorite that landed uh, a couple decades ago and was found big news. 30 years ago when it was uh, reported that life from outer space has reached Earth, albeit only from Mars. But I think this is what is part of the drip, drip, drip of disclosure, just giving us little bits at a time, let people become familiar with the whole idea of life outside of Earth. And then of course, building up towards much bigger reveals. So underneath the ice is what could be very, very revealing because there's already 150 known subglacial lakes and they're all interconnected with under ice rivers as can be seen in this here map. This area just below Lake Vostok, which I'll talk about in a second, is so many lakes, they call it the lake region. And because water seeks its own level, it will flow off of the East Antarctic continent and create vast rivers under the ice, including fjords such as this one that could extend for hundreds of miles under the ice. And I'll talk a little bit about what the Nazis may have discovered with their U-boats entering into the New Schwabenland fjords. But here you can see the distribution of lakes and rivers underneath the polar plateau in Antarctica. So a whole subterranean world down there we know very little about. And this is the coring into Lake Vostok, which is among the top 10 largest freshwater lakes in the world that nobody's ever even heard of. There's another barbet for you. Name the big subglacial lake <laughs> in Antarctica. And it's Lake Vostok where the Russians have cored through 2.2 miles of ice to finally reach the bubble dome, which is over Lake Vostok. Presumably it's geothermically heated because it's not frozen. 
and they were able to take a well get get all the way through the ice in 2012 but it was a contaminated drill but in 2016 they made it through and got a sample of bacteria out of the water in Lake Vostok to find it had never been seen before that had presumably come off of a fish that is as yet discovered so many different surprises may await especially what kind of life could live in this deep, large Lake Vostok. So big that it was first discovered with radar technology and satellites, finding this great big depression in the ice and reasoning that it's an ice dome covering one of these great big lakes. And sure enough, that was absolutely correct. And a new na name lake came from the Vostok station, which had been there previously. And if you ever look at those Earthwatch uh, reports about what's going on in the world, where the volcanoes and earthquakes are, they'll often give the hottest temperatures and the coldest temperatures. So for heat in the northern hemisphere in the summer, you get Death Valley clocking in at 130 degrees. And then down in Lake Vostok, or Vostok Station, I should say, up on the polar plateau in the winter, you'll get the same kind of readings, but below zero over 100 degrees below zero. So cold, I've been told it will freeze and frostbite your skin upon contact. So if anybody were ever to have to go outside in that kind of cold, uh, everything is covered head to toe. If there's any leaks anywhere, you're risking your life. It's very dangerous, but Vostok is one of the year round stations where they'll have four months of complete darkness in the winter. And that's about to start pretty soon. And this is what you would see if you wintered over in Lake Vostok, which very, very few people ever do. And that is the southern lights of the polar region called Aurora Australis. It's interesting that it's named Australis because these lights were detected actually before Antarctica was even discovered. First in 1821, 200 years ago, by whalers and sealers who read Captain Cook's account of sailing around the Southern Ocean, but never discovered Antarctica. He only wrote about it, and then people read how rich the Southern Ocean was with whale and sea life. And then they came down uh, in the early 19th century, but by the late 19th century and into the 20th century, many species of whales and seals were nearly hunted to extinction. So much so that by the 1960s, many of those species were considered commercially extinct, meaning there's no reason to go down there because you'll find nothing. And that's really what put an end to it, uh, the hunting in Antarctica of whales and seals. But it was put in the Antarctic Treaty that uh, these species would be protected. And since then, seals have bounced back to their pre-hunting numbers, but whales have not because their gestation period is so long. And had it not been for a couple rogue pods of blue whales and the right whales, they'd have been gone from the planet and extinction is forever. So good thing for that. So it was called Aurora Australis because the unknown lands were called Australia, the terra incognita of the early explorers, the land unknown. And I'll show you at the end here some maps, early maps of Antarctica, and sometimes Australia is connected because that was the southern continent. Only when it was discovered by uh, Captain Cook himself, by circumnavigating around the Southern Ocean, uh, again, proving that the flat Earth theory is incorrect, that he did show that uh, there were no connections of land but that was first discovered by Drake who was blown off course back into the Atlantic after crossing through the Magellan Straits and then getting his bearings into the Pacific and determining that South America did not connect either. Southern lights are so very rarely seen because only a few dozen people are at the South Pole Station over the winter at, and at Vostok and those are the two most inland bases. And, uh, whereas the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis, are much more frequently seen. There are 60 scientific stations 
in the operation program of 23 nations. We visited six different nations on the Palmer Peninsula. The one being on the bottom, here's our crew of Americans. The Palmer base was uh, only reason they let us come is because we're, we're, we were three Americans. Um, some of the other ones let us come right up. This was the Brown Research Station run by Argentina, as well as these signs you see at all of them with uh, this one's from Chile. And penguins everywhere. Can't get around that. Dr. Michael Sala told me to look into this as I was doing my research before coming down here, that their cosmic rays observed coming out of the earth from Antarctica at a 30 degree angle. Here's just some scientific uh, studies on that and other work that's being done at the South Pole. Now this is interesting that it's coming out of the earth because we're gonna talk about the giant hole that might be not too far from South Pole. It was funny just like putting in a comic relief here in the middle. Uh, all new station arrivals, we were told, are told they have to watch John Carpenter's film, The Thing, to remind them of what might be frozen and locked in the ice beneath them. And so I watched it when I got back and took these little screenshots. Indeed, in the movie, they find a giant craft under the ice. And apparently there are, for real, three, which are named by the alphabet agencies after Columbus's first three ships, Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. And it was funny that this map here, I, I got a shot of that. They made up all the names, but interestingly enough, where they found the UFO in the movie, The Thing, is in the new Schwabenland region. At least I can tell by the outline of the map, which this peninsula was the giveaway. It's not, uh, and they would just do slight changes. It's really Queen Maud land. This is Donning Maud land and then give those German names uh, slightly different names. So uh, here in the Arktowski base, we saw what was about the only life you'll see living in the ground are lichens and mosses. Otherwise, the whole continent is devoid of the color green. You don't see any trees, there's no bushes, very little grasses, and those are only out in some of the uh, Pan-Antarctic islands. Now this uh, seal down below, this has been freeze-dried. Somehow this seal climbed up into the dry valleys 3,000 years ago and the extreme dryness uh, made this seal basically freeze-dried. And scientists go out to look at it every year because it's in uh, this incredible state of preservation for being out in the elements for 3,000 years. You can see how uh, dry and hostile this climate is. And in fact, th these are the dry valleys, not too far away from McMurdo, and uh, it has not rained there for 2 million years. So it is among the driest places on Earth. And in fact, they've practiced the Mars rover, maybe even... Uh, did a little Kubrick filming <laughs> down there too to make it look like Mars and it would. This is as much of a uh, foreign planet as you can find on Earth. And not only that, but it had once been a tropical rainforest. And in the uh, regions around Palmer Peninsula was found this plesiosaur, which is more commonly known as the Loch Ness Monster. And they have this replica in the Palmer Station of some of the bones of the plesiosaur that was found there. Then they have uh, two species of dinosaurs that were only found in Antarctica. I guess I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, but you can read it on the screen. This is one of them. It's like a giant salamander, alligator type dinosaur, completely unique to the southern continent. Only lived there when it was a much warmer place. What lives there today are these uh, ice fish, which are related to mackerels. And these are unique fish only found in the Southern Ocean. This guy's name was Manuel Noriega, and he uh, was down there studying seasonally <coughs> these uh, ice fish. And this is the guy who told me that there was a sighting at another Argentinian base earlier 
that year, about a month before. And they basically saw some crafts and orbs and the whole base cleared out at the Belgrano base to watch uh, this aerial phenomenon, which nobody knew what it was, unidentified flying objects and orbs. Uh, and the interdepartmental banter of the bases got over to these guys at the Brown base, which is also Argentinian. And they heard the account and then uh, I had to do a little arm twisting of this guy. Well, no, not really, but uh, got it out of him that, uh, and he didn't want to tell me at first. And so when you get that kind of reaction, that kind of gives it more credibility. And then finally did say the account I just told you at their other Belgrano 2 base, which I'll show you on a map here in a minute. And the location of that is very close to the new Schwabenland claim, which we're gonna get to. But these are very interesting fish. They have no hemoglobin. They're basically uh, translucent, so you can pretty much see their organs. And no blood, well, it's white blood. It's, it's very unique that these species have adapted to life underneath the ice shelf because they are a completely unique species. And they're, a, uh, they're very much primary species of, of, of food for penguins and seals. So they're very much uh, very bed, bedrock uh, species for other animals to survive on. Now I told you in the first slide of Nassau that there was great melting going on down there. And when we got to the uh, Palmer Station, our guide here, his name is Bob Farrell, he was the station chief. And there is no military, by the way, operating down there. He told us that only military would come if they're called uh, more like a Coast Guard rescue if they needed help. There's no runway here, so there's no landing other than helicopters, and that's not very practical because it's so far away. But he said, when we were going through the galley, take a picture of that painting, which was done in 1986. And he said, this section here was all frozen and connected to Anvers Island, which is seen down here. And this is called Pie Island. You can make out this standalone island was once under the ice, right here under that chunk. And because of the melting, um, it broke off the ice bridge and a new island has emerged, which got the name Pie Island because it came, the, the ice bridge broke on Pie Day, which is sometime in March. And they named it that. Um, and Bob Farrell also said that when he started coming here to the Palmer Station, that the top glacier on Anvers Islands was so high that he could not see these mountains in the distance. And because it is just literally shrinking in size, that now those distant mountains are visible. And this is also affecting the penguin colonies. There are some species that are doing quite well. In fact, they're invading into the range of the cold weather, weather penguins, the Adelis on the picture below, used to incorporate their rookeries all across here, and now they're shrinking in numbers, whereas these Chinstrap and Jintu are growing in numbers because they're being, um, they're moving into the territory of the Adelis. And now they're all hunting the same ice fish and competing for that. And uh, so there's, there's more penguins in an area where they didn't used to be. This is a funny picture of the mother and the baby, which I took on my uh, iPhone. And I'm getting about this close. And the penguin just didn't flinch. They have no fear of humans. In fact, she's kind of like, hey, hey, you're blocking my view. Get out of the way. You know, trying to look around me. No fear whatsoever of her little chick right there below her. Um, but these Jintu, they are like invasive species into the territory of the Adelie. So this is again, part of the warming of certain areas where invasive species can come down and compete with the uh, adapted colder species, which then have to go farther south themselves for their own hunting. and thus are, are shrinking in numbers. One of the greatest adventure stories of all time was the race to the South Pole, 
one by Raoul Amundsen, pictured here on the left. He was from Norway, and he beat the five Brits in the Scott Party by a mere 35 days. This picture on the right of the Scott Party can see the sunken look on their faces, knowing that the Argentinians had beat them there by a matter of weeks. While Raul Amundsen got out with his pack dogs with no loss of life, all five members of the Scott Party perished on their return trip and are all still buried in the ice one day to just be taken off the ice shelf and deposited into the Southern Ocean. So now I'll get into the speculation of what might be going on down in Antarctica. And this is what I was specifically going up down to find. What I did find very conclusively, which ties into Linda Moulton Howe's map of Brian S. Whistleblower, that there is a giant no-fly zone right there over the South Pole region. Uh, about 50 miles or 100 miles um, out towards uh, the Wilkes land. And there is a station there called Davis that's run by New Zealand. And Brian S., uh, one of his assignments was flying from Mactown to Pole. So he'd be over the Trans-Antarctic Mountains all the time where he saw silver disks and the weirdness of the Beardmore Glacier, which Linda Moulton Howe, this is one of his whistleblowers, also said there were Spartan 1 and 2, and they found a giant craft on the Beardmore. And Brian S. says he had UFO sightings of that area as well. And he, one of his flying assignments was to drop off supplies at Pole. They got the distress call that they needed to go to the Davis station right over here. He defied orders, which told him to go 100 miles back towards Mactown and then cut over. But because it was an emergency, they didn't follow that order and flew over the hole and said it was massive. These are a couple pictures of what it could look like. Now, I can't verify in this speculation section how much of this could be photoshopped, but there are frequent images from outer space of a massive hole there. Now, this could just be going through the polar plateau two miles, and that's pretty spectacular itself. Or it could be going into some kind of inner earth that uh, Admiral Byrd talked about in his diaries, whether those are faked or not or other accounts, uh, but my job as a researcher is to try to put together data points. And when I get multiple points at something like this hole in the ice, it starts to register as quite possibly as being true. Have to go there to see it, but the fact that the NSA, no such agency, uh, which is in charge of anything extraterrestrial, has a mysterious building at McMurdo that nobody can go into. And they also have some people out at South Pole Station. So if the NSA is there, there's probably something paranormal going on for them to be there. So this is the map of New Schwabenland. And I'll show you where it is on the bigger map in a second. But what's really interesting to see here are these Schumacher ponds. And then all the uh, mountains around here have these German names, the Wulhat and the Mulling Hoffman Goring Range. Um, and the original party that went to scout out for the base 211 or the New Berlin base, they landed a seaplane in the Schumacher Ponds that was named after the uh, flight captain who stayed behind with the water plane and did some measurements and found out indeed there is geothermal activity here because the water was warmer as he went lower with his measurements. Whereas his team set off from the Schumacher Ponds to these mountains here. And I would put that as the most likely location of the New Berlin base. Talk about a cool series. We were talking about maybe going down there last season with the production crew and I would go with to uh, film some series of looking for the ancient base and filming in this part of Antarctica. Of course, COVID didn't allow that, so we changed our plans and 
looking at next year or in future years. So this was the claim of the Antarctic expedition of 1939, 1938, 39. And here was the badge. Now, from just looking at it, you wouldn't think it's too out of the ordinary. Looks like an expedition bag. But what's so interesting are these oak leaves, which clearly reveal Thule Society paternity, meaning they were studying the occult in Antarctica. And those leaves, those oak leaves, are an indication of such. So this is what the map today would show the area of New Schwabenland. Basically, the Palmer Peninsula is just off the map here. But there's the Belgrano II base where the Argentinians had the UFO sighting. And it is pretty much in this area, the Drawning Mod or Queen Mod land. I want you to keep an eye on this base here, Conan. This is a seasonal base up on the Polar Plateau. Neumeier is the Germans' year-round base. And when I was going over maps from the Cold War era, I was amazed to see that the Germans never left this area. They have always been here. From the late 1930s, when they discovered the Schumacher Ponds and established Base 211, which would be pretty close to the Tor base, somewhere between the India base and the Norwegian base, We'd certainly have to get support from them as well as the Russian base here to go explore into this area. And surely they must know something about it too. But keep an eye on this Conan base because I think this is the location of what I could say is one of the three large UFO crafts under the ice. And there it is. Same GPS coordinates. And I think the Germans found this in the 1930s. Now, if you go in the Wayback Machine of Google Earth to year 2013, you'll find this image which shows a runway track and snowmobile track and some digging and excavation. That says 2018 because that's when I was looking at it and collecting these photos. But this is a blow up of it. And I always like it when uh, data points connect. So the... Farsight Institute had their remote viewers go here, and indeed, they said this is some kind of massive machine under the ice. Could be extraterrestrial, could be something ancient astronaut, but there's something down there. And then they put up these uh, like circus tent poles over the whole thing, and if you were to go there today, this is what that site looks like, which is kind of interesting, kind of revealing, and may be the connection of these 19 points. I believe it's 19 of these uh, circus tent tops sticking out and 19 points on the top of this, uh, what looks like some giant radiator, but you can catch the size of it because if that's a plain runway and these are snowmobile tracks and these are some outbuildings with maybe an entrance here, maybe that is what the enigmatic door is known as and they can still access it at times. All around Antarctica are all kinds of finds on Google Earth. And I don't really know what to make of this because some things could be a trick of the eye, could be shadows. There's this guy who does these video called Florida Marquee I follow. And he's very interesting. I'd say though about 90% I think are just shadows or the way the light is cast. And maybe our eyes are trained to see what we want to see. But these look awfully round. And Mother Nature does not create perfect round or 90 degree angles in succession. So this one does look like it's poking out of the rock with a shadow below it. This is another location up here. Could it be a shadow? I don't know. You see, the cost of going down there is so expensive. I have been to all seven continents, what I've traveled around the world in my life. I'd love to go back to Antarctica, but I'll tell you this, this is the hardest place in the world to travel. And it's very expensive. With enough money, you can mount an expedition anywhere. But wouldn't it stink if you went all the way out to this site uh, at great expense at time and potentially your life if you get caught in a storm and found that this site was only a shadow.
So you want to be sure where you're going. And that also includes these pyramids, which have been featured in Ancient Aliens and many other shows. When I showed these to this group of adventure travel folk that could take an expedition down there, they recognized the one on the bottom here. And this is um, on the Palmer Peninsula. Say, oh yeah, we fly over that all the time. So well, what is it? And they said, it's a nun attack, which is just an attractive mountain sticking out of the ice. When I asked if they've ever stopped there or did any excavation on it, the answer was no. We just fly over it and we marvel at it. So I think the jury's out on that one. Apparently there are three pyramid ranges in Antarctica, another one in the Shackleton Range, I believe in these Herbert Mountain area. Um, and that is these ones. And then there's other ones on the other side facing uh, Australia, right on the coast where there are apparently some other pyramids. Again, the jury's out on this. We need to go down there and do an expedition, uh, a real archeological examination of these and just find out if they're real or not. This is one I did debunk. Uh, there is an airstrip. Uh, this is the Union Glacier and this adventure travel group stops there and they make an outstation over here. And so they fly in from Punta Serena's Chile, they land on the airstrip, they stay at the outbuildings. But then there was this data dump a couple years ago where anybody that wore the Fitbit or used the Strava app on their smartphone, say they wanted to time their jog or a bike ride, it'll give you the data. And so there was a big data dump of all this that got out and all sorts of movement around Antarctica, including right here on this Union Glacier. So people were saying it's a UFO base. Well, when I talked to the adventure travel company, they said, no, there's actually a very logical explanation for that. That particular year, <coughs> excuse me, they had done a triathlon. And this is the area they did it at, so-called so, so UFO base. So that didn't pan out. But you got to look at this from all angles. And I suppose that's why I still show this to just let people know that there are some things that have logical explanation behind it. Well, this is known that in the years 2015 and 2016, you have all the uh, quite a bit of elites going down there to different locations in Antarctica, which are also very interesting, such as here's John Kerry going down on election day 2016. You'd think his party would need him up in the states campaigning for their party. But no, here's John Kerry down in Antarctica as a climate champion. Well, he flew inland a couple days, and I have a source in McMurdo that uh, said that they went on an undisclosed mission somewhere. And I'll show you a little later on where I think they went to some of these possible underground bases. Here's Buzz Aldrin, who had to be evacuated out and had a uh, a tweet that went something like, we have seen Dane, we have seen the enemy, we're all in danger, uh, and he had to leave in a hurry. Here's King Carlos of Spain, so you have a royalty going down there, including Prince William, who with a bunch of his army buddies, went cross-country skiing out from South Pole towards that giant hole. They went one degree south and came back in a week. I think they knew what they were going to see. And possibly the most interesting of all is this patriarch Krill, an elderly, frail old man coming down to bless this chapel. Well, that's the cover story, but a lot of people think he accompanied the Ark of Gabriel, which was excavated in Saudi Arabia in uh, 2015. And that's what the uh, collapsed crane at Mecca was all about. That was part of the excavation. When they found something, there was a burst of energy. And then a few weeks later was the cover story of the stampede of people. And that was another burst of this energy from the Ark of Gabriel that the Saudis just said, get this thing out of here. We can't have this in Mecca. The Russians volunteered, and that much is known, that an armada of Russian ships came to Jeddah 
and left for Antarctica right after that. And so this Patriarch Krill was going down there to make sure it stayed put in what is reported to have been left in an old Nazi base, the Ark of Gabriel, which may also be the receptacle of the Spear of Destiny, which was taken out of Austria at the beginning of World War II. The Nazis were very much into the occult and wanted to find anything techno-magical, they called it, that may give them an advantage. And indeed, they may have backward engineered craft. This could be another fake. My uh, source at the Adventure Travel Company said that there's no Huey helicopters in all of Antarctica. But there is a place called the Illuminati Disneyland that these elite like to call and go down there and see something. Um, maybe it's the other one, or this is a really good job at faking something below the ice, but apparently one of the Nina Pinter Santa Maria are three mile wide, long and very ancient and, very, and built for very, very tall inhabitants, uh, such as 20 feet tall. There are also these known entrances that can be seen on Google Earth, several of them, including in this one area, two of them within a couple miles apart. Can't make out this one too well, but there's another one quite like this with this very characteristic lip. And these things are a lot bigger than they look. You could fly a plane pretty safely into them or a dish-shaped craft. Some other pictures I came across, let's take them for what they are. Is this Admiral Byrd finding some kind of ancient civilization or clever Photoshop? I can't verify either way, including this giant uh, orb with these submarines popping up to do an excavation. Don't know. But what is known is that Google Earth clearly masks off certain sites, including if you went to look for that South Pole hole, it's all masked off. I've been there. There is a round mass though, that's kind of interesting, uh, and other rectangular or square shapes where they didn't even have the wherewithal to come in with some basic Photoshop tools and just create uh, <laughs> some other mountains or use the uh, erase tool and, and or put something in from the nearby landscape. Now just throw down a, a mask and you ain't seeing what's under there. So then they give us some of these. So what's going on? I mean, they, these are absolutely humongous. And this one is the size of a small town. It's so big. Whereas this one, it looks like it is part of an excavation and there are snowmobile tracks. And keep in mind that mother nature does not create perfect right angles like this, uh, with replete with steps going up. It, these look like it could come out of a, a Mayan city or what's below the ocean off of Cuba that has been discovered, which I have in my uh, modern esoteric book. And all my Antarctica information is in my new book, Beyond Esoteric, including the Nazi base and the black goo, which we're gonna get to here in a minute. Uh, here's a picture of what the uh, supercontinent would have looked like called Gwandawana land. This is just a disbursement of some of the species that connect and knowing that this Pangaea had once been a mega continent that broke apart. We've all seen how well Africa and South America fit, including megafauna and mega uh, large animals that had once lived on them both, flora and fauna, uh, now extinct as Antarctica is 99% covered in ice and very, very little land life exists in Antarctica today. So here are the uh, fault lines which bisect West Antarctica out here and East Antarctica here. This is where all the volcanic activity is. And this is also presumably where some of these underground bases are. This is a map of the fault line that goes right through the Mid-Atlantic Ridge straight through New Schwabenland. So that's the Schumacher Ponds and then carries on to New Zealand and the Ring of Fire discovered by the Germans uh, of volcanic origin. This is what uh, the Greeks knew that there must be a Southern continent. 
and it was drawn into Magellan's original map when he charted out the Straits of Magellan, just drew the continent as a large landmass. Show you some more maps. Here's the Piri Reis map in 1520, charting all these uh, islands, which were later discovered, some off the coast of Antarctica. How could he have known this in 1520? But um, in the source notes here, it does say that Perry Reese had used earlier maps that were found in the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. And that was a common trait of cartographers to share information in the form of maps. Now here's the Bache map from the 18th century with a water channel right through the middle. Again, how would they know how Antarctica would look without the ice? That being islands as yet to be discovered or are recently being discovered like Pie Island or this great channel through the middle. Well, here's what Antarctica looks like without the ice. Indeed, there is a channel through the middle. There's Western Antarctica and this is the very old East Antarctic plate, which is among the original land masses on earth, over 3 billion years old. But look at if we took the ice away, these massive fjords that go for literally hundreds of miles under the ice and possibly even a connection between East and West Antarctica. But right here in the New Schwaben land, there you go, a massive fjord, hundreds of miles long that the German U-boats quite possibly got underneath and explored and had a submarine base at the New Berlin city that they were creating down there. Some other old maps, this one from 1531, showing Australia and Antarctica connected. But in the uh, Ice Age years, that pole uh, would have been a lot bigger, the polar region of the South maybe even extending up to Australia. Corey Goods describes an antediluvian civilization. He claims he was there on the excavation site where megalithic buildings were being discovered and megafauna such as woolly mammoths being pulled out of there, a mammoth on the trailer. He says that Antarctica was Atlantis. Uh, but much further north, 35,000 years ago. And then intriguingly, the giants of Antarctica, he claims, look at the Egyptian-like clothes they're wearing, and certainly human-like, but not human, based on the size of their heads, and of course, their giant stature. He also says these are the location of the interplanetary corporate conglomerate. So these, what he is pointing out are the bases mostly along the Palmer Peninsula, but also some near Mactown. So that's probably where John Kerry went for several days. Also remote viewers have been down to look at some of these under ice cities that are geothermically active. Notice how they're all along the fault line. So they would have a free energy source. They would have uh, boiling water, which can be used in many different ways. And then the giant ice dome that would be created underneath. And he, he said, and some of these remote viewers that they're factory towns, they're producing stuff, probably their own food as well, um, and people living down there full time. So one final very strange anomaly in the waters of South Southern Ocean are the South Sandwich Islands in the South Atlantic, some of the most remote islands in the world. Here, of course, is Ushuaia sailing across to the Pan-Antarctic Islands of uh, King George Island right there, and then crossing over to the mainland of the Palmer Peninsula. That's the trip I took, and then we left from approximately there up to uh, Cape Horn, southernmost point of South America. Here's the Falklands. And then these are the South Georgia, and here are the South Sandwich Islands. So I just wanna make everybody aware of this particular island called Southern Thule, which is approximately right there. One of the most remote islands on the planet. A lot of people don't know, but the 
war over the Falkland Islands, the Argentinians call them the Isles Malvinas. You can get in a barroom fight if you call them the Falklands down in Ushuaia. They're not too keen on that. And they still claim them in Argentina. But of course, in the year 1982, you have this massive armada of ships coming out from Britain. And a lot of people don't know that ship armada split into two. This is a map on the right of, from uh, Wikipedia. And the southernmost island where they were going was this southern Thule Island. And it's interesting if you go to Google Earth today, there are certain sections that you cannot zoom in on and see. But other parts are crystal clear. And so the Falkland War ended on South Thule Island. This is where the surrender of eight researchers at the Corbeta Uruguay station, put up a white flag. There was not a shot fired. They came aboard this ship and they signed the Argentinian surrender. And that was the last operation of the Falkland Wars where the surrender was signed. But what was really there? Maybe there was a prize bigger. And you can see in the slide before the Corbeta Uruguay station right there. So what it looks like closer above. Uh, and this is the only above ground base. They were studying something far more valuable underground. And after Operation Keyhole, which was the specific British operation to go to Southern Thule Island to collect the black goo, which was being studied by the Argentinians for years. After the Brits went down there, they destroyed this base in the following year and they took the black goo out. Many people think who really study this and not only war historians, but those who study the black goo think that the Falkland Wars was really fought over the capture and collection of Southern Thule Island and the black goo. What is the black goo and why was it stored at South Thule Island? Well, I'm glad you asked because in reality, it's a very intelligent life form. It's sentient and it is alive. Not in the sense that we know life to be as a mammal or even an insect, but something in this black goo form. And it is available in several various forms. Now there's two kinds of black goo on planet earth. One is of an indigenous nature and it too is also sentient. But another, which was found here on South Thule Island is brought here because of the ETs. The common narrative is this, that in the year 7,700, not too distant, the great volcano on the island of Sumatra called Toba erupted. About the size of what Yellowstone would be, massive volcanic eruption. I, I traveled to and I visited Lake Toba and it's a massive caldera on the northern part of Sumatra. And at that time, only 7,700 years ago, it created a nuclear winter, a black sky for many years and decades where many humans perished, died naturally of exposure, lack of food, and the temperature cooled quite a bit. There were so few humans in the world only 7,700 years ago, we could have filled one of our larger football stadiums with about 50,000 humans on the entire planet. Because it was vulnerable for an alien invasion, not many humans to wipe out and claim this planet, but Earth was always meant to be humans on the surface, at least for the last few million years and in the future to come. So because humans were very vulnerable at the time, other benevolent ETs brought the black goo, this particular substance here because it can rapidly clone or self-organize itself mechanically in a variety of ways because of its magnetic property. And so this would be a way to rapidly clone life as we know it. So if we were ever under an alien attack, this receptacle on South Thule Island could be used to rapidly clone humans, 
who may be able to counter the alien invasion in numbers and remain here. That's the backstory of why it was put here. This base was studying it. The Argentinians were displaced. They were doing it responsibly. They never let the black goo off the island. But when it warms up, it creates problems and it can self-replicate and it can get out there. Uh, I suppose I could do a whole lecture about the black goo because it's so interesting, but I'll just leave it at this. The ETs that brought it here warned us that if it ever did get out, it would wreak havoc on earth. So this is in the uh, mid 1980s, the Brits took it back to London in Marconi laboratories, it did get out and it killed a bunch of scientists quite mysteriously. It was reported being in the London sewage system, in which case it was warm enough so it could self-replicate and get out. Uh, I am among some researchers who suggest that it could be part of the Morgellons phenomenon, the Morgellons syndrome of these uh, poly fibers coming out of the body but leave behind a black tar-like substance even after the fibers leave. Again, this could be a whole lecture series and I'm almost done here, but just wanna leave you with another very weird anomaly of the islands around Antarctica containing this black goo. And if those poles were to shift in the direction where the magnetic poles are going, we might have a North Pole over uh, Canada and the Pacific Northwest, and then the South Pole moving rapidly towards Australia which could become the next Antarctica, a frozen continent, where the current Antarctica with a pole shift move could warm up and we'd find out what's below the ice, including maybe remnants of Atlantis and maybe other secrets that have yet to be revealed. So this is a final video I took with my iPhone. Giving you a look at amazingly beautiful majestic mountains. And here are a bunch of whales frolicking and feeding, flashing us some whales, tails. Wow. That is very close. That's only about 50 feet away. Oh boy. Oh man! Ho ho ho! Right under! No, I did. Where'd they go? That's a weird feeling. Hope it's not Moby Dick. <laughs> Amazing. In the belly of the beast. And you see a little uh, water percolate up. So they swam under That's the boat. Amazing. And, and sent up some uh, air bubbles. And it was the, the bull male that came at us. And I, when I was reading about ancient whaling or down uh, 200 years ago, it would always be the male who would charge the whaling ship and they would be the first to get killed, protecting his little family unit. And you saw that exact same thing happen. A naturalist friend of mine saw that video and he recognized them as the right whale. And those are extremely rare and were nearly hunted to extinction. So those are the kind of weird and wonderful things I found down there. And what a great expedition it was. Uh, and I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to present here today. Thank you guys for having me on and giving me the, uh, this opportunity to share it with you. Yes, I'm glad you finally got to show us everything. <laughs> All this will be awesome. revealed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brad, just uh, as we're wrapping it up here, um, before we go to uh, a little bit of a break, 
Um, just tell people where they can find you, get in touch with you, what new projects you got going on. Sure. These, these are a couple of books on screen, including the new one, which has uh, the Antarctica material and black goo in it, as well as so many other things. It's quite a 480-page book. If you want to know more about me, you can go to bradolson.com, the various projects I'm working on, and my publishing business website, cccpublishing.com. And any books that are ordered through CCC Publishing come through my office, and I'll have an opportunity to sign copies for people, any of the books in the catalog we can send out. And uh, those are the main places. If you want to find out more, there are links on bradolson.com to some of the other uh, YouTube pages I have and uh, social media. Thank you.